Well, Dallas, we we're talking about your book, Divine Conspiracy, which has impacted so many people at such a deep level. And I know the name is not something that you chose casually. So tell us, why do you use the language of conspiracy and why divine conspiracy? Well, a conspiracy refers to people uh, so close to one another that they can talk in whispers. It's a situation where you have people engaged in something that isn't open and obvious. And the divine conspiracy would be accordingly an operation of some sort that is not explicit to the world, but is going on in collaboration with God. And uh, the idea of a divine conspiracy seems to me to precisely fit what you see laid out in the scriptures. God is doing something. He's working with some people. It isn't always clear who they are or what he's doing, but you can tell that something big is in the offing, is going on. Now, God is doing something, but he doesn't run over people with it. He does it in a way that is effective, but depends upon them choosing to be a part of what God is doing. So that idea is really at the core of it, that, and it's way bigger than what we often think about as just organized religion or little branches of Christianity, that every yes. human being has this suspicion, there's something going on That's in right. my life, in my work, in the world. There's something big and deep going on, but I feel like I'm afraid I might be on the outside of it. And mm -hmm. you're saying that suspicion that we have is kind of an indicator of reality. There is something big going on. Well, it's what you remember. It's often quoted Augustine speaks about that place in our heart that is unfilled. Yeah. And human beings are like that. They are essentially unfulfilled beings. And they're looking for something greater that will take them in. And the idea of the divine conspiracy says, yes, that's right. And it is much bigger than religion. Religion often runs contrary to the divine conspiracy. Now, the, we all want for there to be a God who's up to something wonderful. So that part sounds yes. good. Yes. But why is it a divine conspiracy? Why not just a divine takeover? Why does it show up in obscure or partly hidden ways, why doesn't God just come and make everything wonderful? That's a really good question. Well, that's, that's why I'm asking it. Yes. You're the smart guy really, that's supposed to that's answer. That's a really good question. <laughs> and I get constant queries about some terrible thing that has happened uh, because uh, one dimension of this question is what is called the problem of evil. Why doesn't God stop bad things if he's in charge? I think that you have to back up a moment and think about what his purposes are. What might be the outcome of the divine conspiracy before you can begin to answer that question. He doesn't jump down our throats. He doesn't dominate our world. He allows us to think maybe we dominate our world. And, uh, that's and what, is, what is God's purpose that would lead him to that strategy? Yes, the purpose is to develop character in people that he can trust with his power. Hmm. And the development to develop character in, in people, people that he can trust with his yes. power. See, uh, an essential part of the divine conspiracy is this idea of power sharing. But power makes tremendous demands on your character. And by your character, I mean what you routinely think and feel and what you're ready to do without thinking and so on. Uh, we see it in many areas in human life. We want character. We want good character. Yeah. And if we're going to be intimate and close with someone, that's a necessity. So a conspiracy is something where there's intimacy and closeness. Mm -hmm. And so the real issue is character. Mm -hmm. And God has created a world which is such that there is room for us to 
thumb our nose at him if we wish or to think we can get around him always for our purposes. And the deepest question I think about character is whether or not it's all about us or is it about something bigger than us? Particularly, is it about God and his kingdom? Well, that brings us to one of the most important parts of the beginning of the book, which is around this old word of gospel, the gospel. If you were going to say what the gospel is in just a sentence or so, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that you can now, where you are and who you are, be involved in what God is doing in this universe. Say that one more time. It is the good news that you, whoever you are and wherever you are, can be involved in what God is now doing in this universe. I like to put it in terms of Jesus by saying that the good news is that you can be a part of what Jesus, the resurrected Christ, is now doing in this world. And that, of course, goes far beyond religion. And most importantly, it extends to vocation because the primary uh, bearing of the good news of the kingdom of God and its availability is upon me in my real life circumstances where I get to be a student of Jesus in learning how to live in the kingdom of God now. So the gospel is not just for something that happens after you die. No, no. It's, it's about each moment, no, really. That's right. I like to tell people, if you want to go to heaven, now is the time to do it. <laughs> Let that other business take care of itself, and it will. And you'll be very happy if you now learn to live in the kingdom of God, or as the book of Matthew routinely calls it because of its Jewish orientation, the kingdom of the heavens. Yeah. The idea from the beginning on in the Bible is that God is present with human beings. Uh, he made them for that purpose. And you see it all the way from the Garden of Eden to the tabernacle built in the wilderness up to Emmanuel, Jesus, and his saying, I am with you always, yeah. even to the end of the world. Now, I know for many people who are listening to this conversation, that, that phrase will touch a longing and a frustration. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll all think, to be with God and to think that God loves me and is giving me power and energy for yes. life would be a great thing. Yes. But so often I don't feel like I'm with him or I'll pray and I don't hear an answer. What do you say to people who say, I would like for that to be true, but I don't know how? That the way into the reality of this is to become a student or apprentice of Jesus Christ. That means stated in round terms that you trust him enough to put into action what he said. That is where you know by experience the reality of God's kingdom. That's why he said, seek more than anything else the kingdom of God. Now, seeking is a process. And you enter into the process by becoming a student or apprentice we can use the word disciple, it's perfectly good, except it's worn out now. Right. And, uh, but it, it has that uh, idea of learning a practice from someone. And when we do that, and we trust Jesus enough to begin to think that the things that he said that we do should be put into practice, then we come to know the kingdom of God. And then these issues like, where is God when I pray? and why doesn't he straighten things out, and so on, begin to clear up. The key is always, think well enough of Jesus to trust him. One other question from the first part of the book, you sometimes contrast the good news of Jesus with what you call the gospel of sin management. Right. And that's a little phrase that I'll see in numbers of other folks that are writing or teaching. 
What exactly do you mean by what is the gospel of sin management? Well, the gospel of sin management, and there are several of them, but they all have in common the idea that the basic issue is what to do about sin. Now, from your background and mine, that meant what to do about our own sin. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you are uh, more to the left wing of, uh, cult of thought in our culture, that will be what to do about uh, what we call structural evils, injustice, poverty, and things of that sort. But in both cases, it's still directed just at what to do about sin, not what to do about life. See, that's a different idea. And the truth of the matter is because God made us the way he did, and that is imprinted upon our basic nature, we would need grace if we had never sinned. Grace is God's action in our life to help us do what we can't do on our own. And that's practically everything worth doing. <laughs> okay, I want to pause there for a moment because, again, I think for a lot of us, when we hear grace, we think of forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that grace includes the fact that God forgives us of sin, but it's larger than that, and that yes. even if we had never sinned, we would need grace. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because so again, what grace is? God's acting in our life to accomplish what we can't do on our own. Now, you think about it, and of course, that's the story of biblical religion. It isn't just dealing with sin, either individual or corporate, it's living life. That's what it's all about. I've heard you say, saints burn more grace than sinners ever could. Oh, by all means. Sinners just need a little forgiveness, or a lot of it, as the case may be. <laughs> but the saint utilizes grace in everything they do. That's called practicing the presence of God by some writers. But even that needs to be removed from the especially religious area so that we know that we are practicing the presence of God whenever we are uh, doing our basic work, our vocation, when we're in our families. And our that community. really is learning to live by grace That's where exactly I'm somehow right. receiving right. Uh, power beyond myself. That's right. And, yeah. and the primary thing there, John, is knowing that you don't have to make it happen. Yeah. See, that you act, but your confidence is in God's presence to act with you. Is it possible that folks listening to us, when they get an idea about a parenting problem or an idea for a new filing system at work or, or something, yes. are actually experiencing God God's leading and God's power in more ways than we know. Oh, yes. I think that this is a part of what Paul means when he said on, in Acts 17, in him we live and move and have our being. Now, we don't know who it is, but... That's the, part of the conspiracy. That's part of the conspiracy because, you see, now we have a choice. Can we do the little... Uh, little Jack Horner thing when I get a poem and say, what a grand fellow am I? Or do we open up in thankfulness to God and the realization that we really are in an environment, a spiritual environment at all times that it nourishes and reaches out to us even if we don't know the source. The uh, story in Acts 14 of Paul at Lystra when he heals the lame man, you'll recall, and then they come out and try to worship him uh, as if he were a god. And he's, no, no, no. And he says, now, God has always had his eye on you, and he's provided for you. I love the old English, fills your hearts with food and gladness. <laughs> god has been doing that. God has been doing that all along. See, the God that we are able to know through how Jesus presents him is a God who actually does love everyone. Now, this gets us 
into another hugely important part of the book, maybe the most important part, and one that I think many folks will wrestle with. What kind of person is God? How should I be thinking about God? The uh, preferred way of thinking about God is to think of him as a father and to think accordingly of a family. Uh, fatherhood is, the, from a human point of view, uh, the best way of thinking of God. Think of how a father has care and supervision and love. Now, of course, it's an ideal picture because humans have ruined fatherhood. Yeah. And in particular, they've reduced it to a biological function, which is still creative. But being a father is not just a matter of uh, perpetrating your genes on someone. Uh, it has to do with being in a personal relationship to that individual. You tell a story in the book about being on a beach in South Africa mm -hmm. and seeing great beauty mm -hmm. and having that cause you to think about what kind of person God is. Do you remember that? I do remember it. It was a, it was a remarkable scene uh, outside of Elizabethtown, I think it was, in South Africa. And there's something about uh, the land and the ocean in that part of the world that is uh, uh, just overwhelming in its grandeur. And when you see it, your heart leaps with joy. And I think that that is essential to this idea of God being a father. Well, and then you said that uh, it made you think that God sees this scene mm -hmm. and billions of others just Absolutely. like it yes. in this world and countless others. Yes. And then you say, although it sounds odd, suddenly I found myself quite happy for God. Yes. <laughs> to think well, about what his, the richness of his experience. In, in, and then this line, that God is the happiest being in the universe. Well, I, I think that that is actually the right view of God. I think it is out of his uh, greatness uh, and the joy in what he is doing. You remember after he created, he turned around and looked at it and said, that's really good. But is that an okay word, happy, a happy God? I, I, I don't think I've heard that word used to apply to him often. Well, I think joy has a little more of a religious tone it to does. it. It does, yeah. But uh, ask yourself if you had someone who was joyous, what would be their mental condition? And uh, you wouldn't want to say they were depressed or probably not unhappy. Uh, you have to come to terms with the fact that you can be happy with something where everything is not to your, uh, to, it doesn't suit you. And certainly the presence of evil in the world is something that does not suit God. I think his happiness is based on his joy and confidence in knowing how this is all going to turn out. I remember a uh, writer in his memoirs reflecting on his father and I was so struck, he talked about his dad used to watch, it was a goofy old TV show with a friend, but he would laugh and laugh, and he was normally quite a stressed person. And this guy who was writing talked about how, what it did for him to see his father happy. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. about that with my children, or with children in general, yes. there are very few things that are a greater gift for that's a child so true. than to think they have a happy that's, father. That's and for so, us so, to so think true. that we have a happy God, that we serve a happy yes. God. See, that's an affirmation of existence. Hmm. That if that's missing in your life, then your burden of running your kingdom becomes intolerable and you have to retreat to uh, some other things, uh, all of the forms of addiction, where addictions are primarily distractions from a condition that uh, is undesirable. Hmm. And so you uh, build ways of, of uh, working with it. We're such a terribly addicted, addictive society because we have put our desires at the head of our list and we can't manage them. And we be, then we need something to help us, alcohol or, or whatever it may be. But it's so important uh, that uh, children 
And I don't think just uh, children. I, I teach, of course, uh, and I think I've often thought one of the most unfortunate circumstances for students is to be caught in a room with a miserable teacher, <laughs> someone who's just unhappy. Yeah. Uh, because older people or people uh, at a more advanced age and responsibility, they, they have the role of affirming or disowning the human condition. And uh, of course parents are, are most important and we know, for example, how, how, what, what a terrible effect it has on a, on a baby uh, to have a mother who is depressed and unable to react with it and so on. And of course, many times the mother can't help it. That's uh, very unfortunate, but it's still, the effects are there. And to think that God is actually happy yeah. is tremendously important. Yeah. And you, that throws you in the issue, well, if you don't think him that way, uh, how do you think of him? So at the core, something really big is going on. We all smell it. Right. And behind that is God. And we can miss it, but we can also see it and be a part of it. That's right. And the good news is that it's available to be active together with God. It's yes. available to everybody listening to us right now if that's they want right. it. And it's uniquely available through Jesus. Yes, that's true. Whose Father is the yes. happiest being in the universe. Absolutely right. And we're going to find out more about what that life looks like the next time we get together. I like that idea. I would too. <laughs>